Well, speaking of better drugs, it's a great segue to our last segment, um, <laughs> which is the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. I don't want to laugh, but I mean, clearly it's, it's, a, it's something where our, our therapies are not as optimal uh, as we'd like them to be. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the first question I think for everybody, and, and this gets to a real judgment call, um, how do you define triple negative breast cancer? I think that's been the real issue. You know, Lee, let's start with you. How do you, how does your, how do you define it? In well, practice? I think the, the standard definition now is less than 1% uh, ERPR. But I have to say how you use that information, particularly for very low level expressors, um, varies in the clinical setting. So if I see somebody who has a, a small percentage of ER positive, I tend to usually treat them like a triple negative breast cancer and not depend on them being very endocrine um, sensitive. And so I, th I think you have to take that into account. For clinical trials, it's good to define it. So I guess, and the next question is really the HER2 positivity. I mean, I think that, you know, as we all know, the ASCO cap has been going back and forth, and I think is now settling, at least for HER2 positivity, on a copy number greater than six, and is moving away from ratios. Have you started to move away from ratios? No, ratios? Not, not on the West Coast. Uh, Everybody still uses ratios yeah, there? I mean, they're still very important. Uh, certainly, you know, high gains, copy numbers, should be consistent with a ratio. Yeah. Right. Kim, you don't you still use, use ratios? The ratio. I mean you, you do. have a copy number of six and four chromosome seventeen. I'm not so certain that's really a HER2 addicted tumor. But. Uh, I agree. I think it's 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 a very problematic area. I think uh, it seems like there's more more patients that you're kind of struggling with whether to give them HER2 directed therapy or not with these guidelines, but we, we still use the ratio. Yeah, I have to disagree with my panelists on this one. I'm, I really have over the years really learned that probably, you know, at least 15 or 20 percent of the patients who I consider triple negative, probably at least in my practice, and again, I don't know what it is around the country, but in my practice, I find a lot of those patients have copy numbers greater than four or six, and I really have started to treat them with trastuzumab. And this may be an area where intrinsic subtyping may help us, you know, potentially. This may be one of those areas, especially defining that triple negative basal subtype, you know, which is, I think, the subtype that we're worried about here. Because triple negative, you know, could be those patients who look basal, but maybe are luminal B or look basal who are HER2 like. I don't know, I mean, that's just kind of my thoughts about this. Yeah, I see the converse. I, I see patients I'm treating as if they're HER2 positive and they progress right through. Right, Pertuzumab, trastuzumab, I put them on I TDM1. Agree. Those are the patients we really should be thinking hard about. Are they really benefiting? Right. And no, I agree with you. I see it going the other way where you kind of hope that the patient has a HER2 positive tumor. You do. You're willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Sure. But then when, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping it will work, I mean, the reality is if they progress pretty quickly on both, you really need to be asking yourself, are they HER2 addicted? Okay. Um, so, I mean, the next question really is, we've kind of talked about definitions of triple negative. What's your standard of care? I mean, Rich, what's your standard of care for triple negative disease? You know, it's Metastatic disease. It's obviously right. chemotherapy, and I think at that point, you know, if it's first line, second line, eventually, uh, presumably patients will get all of the agents. Uh, there's been data to suggest that platinum salts have a preferred activity here, and I, I think it's not unreasonable to start either with a single agent platinum or a platinum combination. We had discussed uh, before the meeting that at San Antonio this year there'll be the TNT data, which is comparing platinum versus docetaxel. Uh, but without strong prospective data, I think there's a lot of options. So really no change. Maybe the only difference, of what I'm hearing is the only difference really is adding platinum maybe to your standard yeah. kind of therapies. Lee? So I take a slightly different view on that. So I think we have to know from the weight of all the evidence over the years of chemotherapy, we know that the two best classes of drugs are taxanes and anthracyclines. And I particularly think anthracyclines are being underutilized in the metastatic setting these days because there's a bias against them. They're good drugs and you can use either liposomal anthro uh, doxorubicin or just doxorubicin itself alone or in combination. So I'll start with a taxane in, in, uh, typically in a triple negative. And do you give it weekly or Q3 weekly? Yes. Docetaxel <laughs> Q3 week and uh, Pacotaxel weekly. Um, and anthracycline, same thing. I mean, I think that, you know, again, when you're thinking about the metastatic setting, you know, you're trying to minimize toxicity. You know, in Q3 weekly, anthracyclines can be kind of toxic if you use them the wrong way. And what are people's thoughts about weekly versus Q3 weekly anthracycline? Not doxel. Let's leave doxel out of the equation for a minute. You know, but what do you think? I, for me, anthracyclines are later in line. I, I think eventually, unless it's a very aggressive tumor and patients decline quickly, they'll have time to get, you know, various chemotherapy agents. But uh, 
anthracycline is usually, if, if they are used, usually it's Q3 weeks. So I give them every three weeks because that's what I'm familiar with and I know how to deal with it and you can throw some new last if they're particularly poor functional status. I feel um, a lot of people have forgotten why we give paclitaxel weekly. Everyone thinks we give it because it's kinder and gentler. But Andy Seidman's study, 9840, showed it's actually way more effective to give paclitaxel weekly than every three weeks. There was actually, the p-value was not significant, but it, the absolute difference in survival was close to eight months if you got weekly paclitaxel versus q 3 week paclitaxel. We don't have good data as it relates to docetaxel, so I think you can give docetaxel q 3 week or weekly, but for paclitaxel, there's pretty strong data that weekly is more effective, and then we've extrapolated that it's better tolerated, although the data is not so great about that. Yeah. So, I mean, the next question is kind of getting into taxanes. Uh, do people use nanoparticle paclitaxel in their practice at all? Uh, I mean, I do. I don't use it that often because of the head-to-head -head study that showed it wasn't superior to weekly paclitaxel. So I usually start with weekly paclitaxel three out of four weeks. That's my, my go-to regimen. I think one of the problems with nap paclitaxel, particularly on the weekly schedule, is we're not quite sure what the correct dose is. And of course, the dose in the CLGB study was a little bit higher, I think, than what we typically would use. So I, I think that's one of the problems with it. But certainly for somebody who you know, has, uh, you know, gets an allergy, an allergy reaction to paclitaxel or whatever, obviously NAB paclitaxel is a great choice for that patient. So Lee, is there any scenario where you use NAB paclitaxel over paclitaxel? Yeah, so in the, uh, as Ruth said, in the patients who have uh, an allergic reaction, it's uncommon, but it does occur, and it can be scary and it can be life-threatening. And then the other group that I use it in are the patients that we want to avoid steroid premedication because uh, you don't need that. So occasionally patients who have diabetes, for example, uh, particularly those who have high swings in their glucoses with uh, dexamethasone. Okay. Yeah, I use a lot of a nanoparticle, um, paclitaxel or braxane. I think not having the steroids is a, is a big deal. 